I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Frederick Pogue. I'm the president of the College of Democrats at ETSU. Tonight we're talking about how new media, social media in particular, has affected uh, politics in the United States. So I'm going to let our panelists introduce ourselves and we'll kick it off. Dr. King, if you'll start us off, please. Start. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm John King. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication. I uh, teach public relations. Do a lot of research on media framing, especially in terms of how uh, governments around the world are framed in the media. I'm working on a study right now on uh, Qatar and how it's framed in uh, the UK newspapers and actually uh, consulting with the government on that. Uh, presented papers on four continents and published on, uh, all over the world and have a lot of interest in politics. It's not my uh, area of uh, ultimate expertise, but I've been a, a fan of it and follower of it for a long time, and uh, I'd like to talk about how it relates to, to public relations a bit and how it relates to uh, uh, how n traditional news values uh, are changing in the realm of social media, too. We're going to have to do this all night, aren't we? So. Uh, my name is Chaz Pazienza. I have a company called DXM Media. I'm a blogger at a site that I started called Deus Ex Malcontent. That's where DXM comes from. Um, I spent about 20 years in television news, starting out at local in Miami, working for NBC and CBS out in Los Angeles, and eventually for uh, MSNBC in New York and CNN in both Atlanta and New York. Um, I got fired by CNN in 2008 for blogging. Um, which kind of made me the go-to person for discussions on the difference between traditional media and new media. Um, and uh, that's really, that's about it. Uh, my name is Bob Seska. I, uh, I'm a writer for the Huffington Post. I'm also the editor, <clears throat> the editor of um, thedailybanter.com. I also run my own site, uh, my own blog, and uh, I'm the co-host with Chez of the... Uh, the Bob and Chez Show, which is a weekly podcast. Plus, we do a subscription-only podcast called The After Party, um, which is less of a party and, and more of a therapy session, I think. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's about it. I, um, my career path has sort of taken all sorts of different twists and turns. I, was, uh, I ran an animation studio for a while. I was in radio, uh, print journalism, and now um, I do a wide variety of things in new media. Hi. Um, I just also want to say just thank you to Fred and Max um, and everyone at, F at FMLA for having me come out. Um, I'm Vanessa Valenti. I'm the co-founder of Feministing.com. Um, I uh, basically uh, came into uh, Feministing. We created it in 2004. I was in grad school. My sister was at a nonprofit uh, organization, and we basically saw this gap that existed where uh, there was no space online for young people to go to talk about feminist issues. So we decided to create this community. Um, so it's been about almost 10 years now, and we are now the largest online feminist community in the world. We have over 900,000 readers a month. Um, and basically talking about, you know, a range of issues, pop culture, media, online, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, online and offline activism. Um, I did recently retire, actually about a week ago, uh, as the managing editor of Feministing, so it's bittersweet, but I, um, but uh, it's exciting at the same time I started a consultancy with uh, Feministing, another editor from Feministing, uh, Courtney Martin, about a year ago. Uh, that we decided most of the work that we do is communications work, so online strategy, basically helping nonprofit organizations and companies um, become more effective um, in their online strategies and sort of use our experiences and passion in online movement building to um, help them be better at the movement building that they're making. Um, but I'm really uh, excited about th this particular project we're working on. Um, around the sustainability of online feminism and activism, which basically is documenting the impact that it's made, and I'll talk a little bit about it probably today, 
over the last 10 years, um, as well as this sustainability issue, which is basically the fact that, okay, we know that it makes impact, we're doing amazing things, but we don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, so um, we're releasing the paper next month and are basically collaborating with a number of uh, women's funding um, folks as well as institutional leaders and other online activists to push it out there and see how we can create more solutions you know, around online activism and really making it as effective as uh, it could be. So, that's me. First question is to Professor King. Dr. King, can you touch on the differences between social and traditional media and how the rise of social media has impacted traditional media? Okay. Well, in traditional uh, news media, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, criticisms of it. Uh, first is the continuous problem of horse race coverage of politics. The, the, all the news is about who's ahead, who's behind, uh, rather than any substantive issues quite often. That's one of the major critiques of it. Also, uh, we see uh, in traditional media a lot of emphasis on national polls that, in my mind, are meaningless. Uh, the electoral math is what really matters. Uh, we see a lot of that. And we see that the number one news value that tends to appear in political coverage is conflict. Uh, and then there are certain conventions of news that, that play into this. And one is that news is inher inherently negative. Uh, that's certainly the case. Also, there is the convention of trying to be balanced, uh, and one thing I've read is that, it's, uh, that the press is amazingly adept at telling both sides of a six-sided story. What we tend to get is rather than the middle ground where the truth lies, we tend to get the extremes, especially true in cable TV news, I think. Uh, there's the idea of accuracy and verification, and the old adage is if your mother says she loves you, you better check it out. And then objectivity, which, uh, like balance, sounds good on the surface, uh, but then there is a heavy reliance on official sources that goes along with that. And I think that this just the facts kind of approach and, and the reliance on official sources means the press is easily, easily manipulated by political strategists and elites. And people like uh, Karl Rove and James Carwell can pretty much write the script for the press because all they've got to do is figure out those news conventions and feed them to the press. Uh, I've actually done some research on this that showed that uh, uh, political writers uh, uh, for George Bush after 9-11 used a lot of rhetorical devices in their, in his speech, in their speech writing for him. And we analyzed the speech from a rhetorical perspective, a colleague in, in speech communication, I did this. I analyzed the media coverage of it around the, the country, and there was almost an exact match between the, those use of those rhetorical devices like alliteration and so forth. Uh, much more likely to land in headlines than, than other types of uh, uh, literary tools. So it's not that difficult to manipulate the press if you understand how they work and if you understand what their conventions are and what they are looking for. Uh, on the social side of it, I think that uh, one of the main differences here is that you have this idea of a, of a citizen, uh, uh, citizen driven media. And it has the potential, I think, to and, and overcome some of these difficulties. Just a few facts about this real quickly. Uh, uh, the Pew Center says that this is the first election, the 2012 election, in which more Americans got their campaign news from the internet than from newspapers. That's significant. How it influences reporters, reporters, social media definitely influences how reporters cover campaigns. A lot of story ideas are generated by monitoring Twitter, monitoring Facebook, monitoring other social sites. Uh, it also has an influence on how the campaigns themselves get around the traditional media filter and get around the gatekeepers. And that's a dream of uh, public relations practitioners is not to have to filter things through the media to get it directly to the publics that you want to reach. Uh, social media has the potential to do that, to reach voters directly. That's certainly true. Uh, and how campaigns and how the media respond to social media uh, is another aspect. Uh, reporters learn of their rivals' work through Twitter, so the whole idea of a scoop has changed dramatically because of that, and, and stories can be discovered just by, by tracking Twitter. That, that happens quite often. A couple more things and I'll, I'll stop. Um, 
Couple of interesting facts. Uh, since the 2008 election, Facebook users have grown 800% uh, and Twitter users have grown 30 times. So this is the first election where social media really had a huge impact, I think, although in the 2008 election it had some impact, but it's, it's, it's much stronger now. Uh, my worry, though, is that we get, especially with Facebook and other consumer-driven media, we tend, and not so much with blogs, but we tend to get what the tidbit journalism. You know, we heard about the binders full of women, and we heard about the Etch-a-Sketch, and we heard about a lot of kind of uh, crazy ideas through the primaries. And those, are, and, and you know, Obama's uh, reference to battleships and swords. Uh, those are the kind of things that, that consumers of social media tended to get overwhelmed with, I think. And the average user, I don't think, drills down into the real issues very much. They just look at that surface kind of thing, especially if they're not reading traditional media or, or delving into blogs like, like these uh, professionals here do. Uh, and they get such a surface understanding. I mean, Herman Cain's 999 plan is a great example. That plan would have raised taxes for 84% of Americans. People didn't understand that in Tennessee, it would have meant a 9% additional sales tax on top of the 9 to 10% we already have. And so when it sounded simple and it sounded, uh, it looked and sounded simple, but what we really need in traditional media, and I think uh, in social media as well, is more explanation, more context. That to me is the crux of the matter. Hello, I'm Randy Owenby, um, and I'm the Vice President of the Feminist Majority Leadership Alliance. And um, this question is for Bob. Um, the foundation of democracy is civil engagement. Um, how does social media help facilitate that, and in what ways does it stifle it? Well, I, you know, obviously, uh, social engagement is the, the, the centerpiece of social media. I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, the exchange of ideas uh, in social media is, is critical to um, to getting um, not only uh, developing activism, but to also um, getting the word out about what's it's sort of a filter for what's really really important, what people are really really concerned about and, and talking about. So I think in that respect, it it provides almost a. Uh, uh, a filter for uh, the traditional press to kind of look in and see what what people are discussing and what's what's critical to them. And in that respect, it actually really uh, has made the traditional media a little more responsive to uh, to the people, to use a, a general term. Um, on the other hand, it can also be a very very bad thing, and that is um, um, social media tends to. Um, be a breeding ground for misinformation and also is exploited as a means of, of transferring misinformation. Um, I mean, one example that uh, I've been talking about this week is, um, I mean, how many people here, uh, just as a show of hands, know that, uh, uh, well, I'll ask, ask it this way. Uh, who believes that the federal budget deficit has gone up since the Obama has been president? How many think it's stayed the same? How many think it's gone down? Uh, yeah, we do. We have a room full of well-informed people. Uh, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg conducted a poll last week in which they asked the same question. Uh, only 6% of voters responded that the deficit has gone down, um, which is remarkable. I think more people believe in goblins than believe that the deficit has gone down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my question is, I wonder how many of those 6% know that the deficit has gone down by more than half a trillion dollars. This is information, or misinformation, as the case may be, that, uh, that either doesn't make it through the social media filters or um, is actually exploited for the purposes of making it seem as if the deficit has gone way, way up. And so... Um, you know, there's, uh, there's two edges to the sword, so to speak. This question is for Chez. How does conflict and the need for conflict influence how media reports the news? And can you give specific examples? Uh, turn on your TV. Pick up, you know, uh, check the internet. It's, it's all, anybody who tells you that the media are liberally biased or, I mean, I guess Fox is conservatively biased, but that says that there's a predominantly liberal bias in media is full of crap. 
Uh, for the most part, the only thing the media are biased towards, the only thing they're addicted to is conflict. Um, I did it for a very, very long time. I was a senior producer at CNN, I was a senior producer at MSNBC. Yeah, it's, it's, if you're, if you're a journalist, especially in, certainly in TV, um, you love the thrill of the chase. You love that, that, that excitement you get when you create drama. And sometimes it's good, sometimes you can create drama out of, out of real stories, and sometimes you take a nothing story and turn it into something that doesn't need to be as big as it is. Um, you know, Dr. King, he made a really great point. I think he called it tidbit journalism. Actually, the, the word I would use is we've become, social media has made us a meme culture, yes. where instead of, uh, instead of paying attention to the really important things, as Dr. King said, we focus on binders full of women because it makes a great internet meme. It turns into, you know, you get to make your little pictures and all that crap. And yeah, and I mean, in the end, you're not really getting anything. You're just getting, you know, that's the stuff that you remember. That's the stuff that sticks in your head. And overall, it's really, really bad for the country because, uh, you know, I, we talked earlier today, Bob and I uh, met with one of the journalism classes and, and we had this discussion about Twitter. Because Bob, um, you know, Bob really likes Twitter, and I like Twitter. I think Twitter's done some amazing things when it comes to getting uh, when it comes to getting news. There's nothing quite like it. But um, the 140 character thing has really sort of dropped our uh, dropped our attention spans, and that's how we think now. We want everything summed up in 140 characters or less. And if it can't be, I think we just kind of tune out. I think it just turns into you know, you know, too long didn't read and. So yeah. but, I mean, let me ask you this: uh, Are the memes there to the exclusion of information, or are they think, supplementary to the I think actual they become, meat and potatoes I think of they the news? They become the most important and memorable thing. Yeah, that's the problem. And it's and you know, as when you and I talked today, they um, uh, one of the problems with that sort of meme-based culture is that because our news cycles turn over so quickly, these things come and go in seconds. You know, it's like for really for you know for a week you got binders full of women, and everybody's oh, like binders full of women, and then it turns into somebody else makes a quote unquote gaffe, and then that becomes the big deal, and no one's attention stays on any one really big issue for very long because we're too busy being distracted by meme culture. But yeah, when it comes to uh, getting back on track, when it comes to conflict, yes, the the media is 100 percent that's their thing. By I mean I've. You know, uh, regardless of my uh, of whatever my political affiliations were, which I always tried to tr uh, check at the door as a journalist anyway, I um, I, you know, I didn't care one bit, no matter how I might have felt personally, when there was an opportunity in television news to you know throw a monkey wrench into things and turn a story, you know, give it a, a 90 degree turn by something you know crazy happening or sort of creating something crazy that happened or making it bigger than it was, I jumped at that, absolutely. I guess I think about this in terms of, of the voter or citizen who is just sort of tangentially engaged, you know. I mean, people who are uh, heavy followers of politics aren't influenced as much by this. But the average person out there doesn't have time. They're working three jobs. They're right, yeah. trying to make a life, you know, and they don't have time to, to, dwell, to, del to dwell into it. And so I think one question to ask is, are we, are we creating informational citizens full of bits and bytes of information? Or are we creating informed citizens who have information, a point of view, and can make sense of what's going on? I think that uh, the memes and the tidbits certainly make exacerbate that problem. You know, well, I, I think more than any other time in in maybe the last 50 years, I think the citizenry is much more informed, and I think that has entirely to do with the internet, social media, new media. Um, years ago, I mean, there was three network newscasts a day and that was it. And if you didn't watch for that half hour a night, or if you didn't pick up a newspaper, and if you did, you skimmed some headlines maybe, but you weren't, you, you weren't engaged in the process. You weren't engaged in what was happening. And I think now you can't help but to be engaged. It's everywhere. If you just have a Facebook page and you have no interest in politics, you, you end up seeing politics anyway because people post about politics on your wall. It's just, it, it's, I think it's benefited uh, informed voters. I think uh, the participation is up, and I think the information level is up. But there's also a dark side to that, too, which is the misinformation. Yeah. Um, Vanessa, um, can activists effectively use social media to translate into social change? 
And in what ways is it effective? In what ways are, is it harmful? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know why y'all are hating on binders full of women. I thought it was awesome. Um, uh, As a meme. And <laughs> yeah, and I think memes are really an entry point for people. And True. I think, you know, just in terms of, you know, the efficacy, let's talk about, I mean, you talked a little bit about how the immediacy of the internet can be really harmful. But I think that, and, and I do, I, I, I totally agree in terms of issue to issue. Do without thinking. Right. So, but I think there's also something amazing about the immediacy too, right? Because never in the history in our history, I think, have we been able to like mobilize thousands of people within a matter of minutes, right? So, um, you know, one specific example that comes to mind is Planned Parenthood and the Komen Foundation um, early last year. The Komen Foundation for um, breast cancer um, funding, basically they were funding Planned Parenthood uh, so that they could give breast cancer screenings to their patients, decided to pull funding from Planned Parenthood, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And people ended up becoming so um, outraged at the decision that was made that this just huge campaign um, on social media, uh, there were 1.3 million tweets directed at Komen, uh, thousands of comments on their Facebook page, and then within that same week, Planned Parenthood raised $3 million in donations from people. So that's not a coincidence, right? Like obviously this was a direct impact um, from these folks that were making action online and Komen ended up reversing the decision. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that there is something really powerful about that immediacy and that it really galvanizes, right, the masses um, to take action on one spe specific issue at a time. Um, so I do think that there is this, this uh, challenge that we are up against in terms of uh, uh, long-term strategizing and, and that kind of systemic change that we want to make um, and using the internet. But I think that we can. I think that there's been some times that we've been able to. Another, uh, and I think that cultural change is a big part of uh, systemic change. And I think that that is also another piece of what social media has done. And Bob touched on it a little bit in terms of, I do think that memes are, are effective. I do think, you know, it's an entry point for people who didn't care about social change issues before to care about it, you know? And while, I mean, I, I understand that it's, you know, it, it, it's a very simple, um, it's, a, it, it's a very simple kind of quick uh, message, it makes, it's funny, right? It's funny and it makes, it engages people and it really, I mean, feministing, for example, um, one of our, our, I would say our absolute, like, one of the biggest reasons why we became so widely read is because we used humor and like talked about fashion and pop culture. And this specifically speaks to, you know, a feminist and we've been stigmatized for many years as, you know, being not funny, you know, humorless feminist. Um, and the fact that we kind of allowed people to engage in this way and, you know, so many of our readers, you know, send us emails being like, oh, I read a, you know, I was Googling Jessica Simpson and came across a post that you guys wrote about her creepy dad and, you know, I started reading and I had no idea feminism still existed and I consider myself a feminist now. So I think that there's such a power in, the, in, in social media and how it's very accessible, right? How it's super accessible and um, allows people also to engage with each other and discuss, discuss the issues, which also speaks to kind of the traditional uh, media and how online media has kind of allowed us to, uh, you know, become these citizens, you know, that are creating our own media um, themselves. But I think in terms of, you know, the harm that it could do is, yeah, that we're, but, but the way that I see it is that we're not doing enough, right? And how can we um, really, and I think that what we need, and speaking to the sustainability issue, at least in my community, is that we don't have the infrastructure, and we don't have the support from folks who, I think people are starting to recognize that it's making a huge impact, um, but I think that it's really a matter of getting institutional leaders, um, you know, uh, uh, just change makers, policy makers together to really figure out how we kind of crack that nut and figure out how can we use social media in an effective way to create systemic lasting change and do that, you know, that, that strategizing. Uh, but I do feel like it's, you know, in terms of, it, it's a messaging issue. And I think that with 
the stuff that we're talking about, it's hard, and I was talking about this in uh, the class that I was in earlier, is that, you know, policy isn't sexy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's really hard to, and that's why binders full of women and those kind of memes are really effective. I think it's just the, I think the important thing is how do we get them to stay? That's the problem, yeah. is that it goes, there's, right. nothing, there's nothing wrong with a good meme if it gets people's attention and it gets them thinking, right. but the problem is we've, our, our attention spans now are so short, and news cycles turn over so quickly. Right that you know, the very next day we've moved on to something else. Right. And we start, we do things like we point out gaffes instead of actually paying attention. You've written a lot about this. Point out gaffes from politicians just because, oh, they're funny, instead of actually paying right. attention to really what those people are saying. Well, and, and this is also, we were talking about the differences and similarities between traditional media and new media. Um, one of the problems that we run into with new media all the time is something that traditional media falls into as well, which is that um, you could write a 2,000 word think piece on your blog uh, with all kinds of wonky details, and uh, the next day you could <laughs> you could write a 500-word post about how Sarah Palin's an idiot, yeah. and the Sarah Palin post will get far more hits than the 2,000-word think piece that may have taken you 10 times longer to write. So I think in, in one respect, you know, you're, you're still in new media, you're subject to um, sensationalism. sensationalism, exactly. And if you want to um, be successful at all, you kind of have to do something that um, is a little sillier. Uh, to make the medicine of the wonkier pieces go down. It's kind of like an actor who does uh, a big summer blockbuster so they can go back to England and do theater. You know, you kind of have to balance those two things. So in that respect, I think memes are actually great because it provides that silliness, that entryway, as you were saying, into, um, into the serious stuff. So I think it's, it's very, very important. I think one other uh, difference here is... Uh, if you look at traditional media, the ownership patterns and the economics behind it, there's a increasingly smaller and smaller number of companies. A handful of companies control most of the mind space in this country. And at least social media has the potential to have wider opinions, more a wider spectrum of opinions, and that's one of the real strengths of it, I think. Uh, I've got a quote here, a historical quote from Walter Lippmann, who wrote Public Opinion. This is 1920s. I think this is pretty apropos t today even. He said, uh, People mostly know the world only indirectly through pictures they make up in their heads, and they receive these mental pictures largely through the media. The problem, Lippmann argued, is that the pictures people have in their heads are hopelessly distorted and incomplete, marred by the irredeemable weaknesses of the press. Just as bad, the public's ability to comprehend the truth, even if it happened to come across it, was undermined by human bias, stereotype, inattentiveness, and ignorance. In the end, Lippmann thought citizens are like theater goers who arrive in the middle of the third act and leave before the last curtain, staying just long enough to decide who is the hero and who is the villain. Media, <laughs> media people price. are such cynical pricks. <laughs> <laughs> they really are so, so nihilistic and misanthropic. That's how I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> Tailor made for me. Uh, this is for Dr. King. Uh, we've been talking about U.S. media, but what are the differences between the U.S. media and international media in terms of content and programming? Well, I think one of the biggest differences, if you look at the BBC or Al Jazeera or uh, other kind of uh, uh, CNN International, is there's less focus on personalities, less focus on trying to make anchors and reporters stars, and, there, and there's just more depth, I think, too. I, I lived in Dubai for a year, uh, been there several times, and absorbed a lot of that media. I actually uh, did research on Al Jazeera, and I've been to their studios in Doha. And... Uh, they, their motto is they give voice to the voiceless. And, uh, and I would say in many regards, they're more of a traditional kind of uh, objective media, at least in that part of the world, than any place else except maybe the uh, national newspaper in the UAE, which is trying to, to be modeled after the New York Times kind of uh, model. But uh, I was interviewed by Al Jazeera. I was there in 2009, I think it was. And they asked me what Americans thought about the Gaza war. And I said, what Gaza war? Americans don't know anything about it because it's not covered. You know, that's one other difference is that we still, uh, in U.S. Uh, news media, don't cover the world very well. And, and the budgets are cut. You don't have any foreign correspondents. If the Palestinians the got stranded on a cruise ship, <laughs> oh, oh my God, it'd be exactly. huge, huge. Yeah. CNN would be all over it. 
And so, I mean, there's, so there's little understanding about those issues, uh, I think, largely because of, of that. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 the CNN and the other cable networks were promising, promising us more in-depth news, but and a lot of times what they really do is just repeat a 30-minute kind of cycle over and over, you know. I'm turning on my microphone. Is that, is that driven by... Um, I, I think a lot of that's driven by audiences, though. I mean, if you were to do a story in primetime on MSNBC about Gaza, would it get the same ratings as a lot of screeching? And, and so I think it's a, there's a chicken and the egg kind of uh, conundrum with yeah, the media. Yeah, so. That's true. Yeah, and it's the same with all of television and all, all of entertainment. Um, you can do serious things, and in a for-profit news media, how, how effective will it be to s satisfy those, you know, shareholders? True, but I think that there's an obligation to give people what they need to know, not just what they want to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that I runs... I, and, and I'm not defending for-profit yeah. news. I'm just saying that um, uh, it, that, that runs contrary yeah, to what, uh, how the news media has evolved since, yeah. you know, since network. And it's definitely yeah. a commodity. News is a commodity. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those, I, I said this earlier today, uh, 1976 Network, Sidney Lumet movie written by Patty Chayefsky. It is the best movie that's ever been made about television and probably ever will be made. It's brilliant. It's shockingly prescient. If you haven't seen it, absolutely see it. It's hilarious and awful and disturbing, and it's just perfect. I, have ra I will rave about that to anybody. Okay, Bob, um, the liberal media bias, does it exist, and how has social media affected this paradigm? Um, no, it doesn't exist. I, I think what exists is, as Chaz was saying earlier, is a, uh, a bias for drama. I think... Um, and whatever work, whatever can be sold to a market segment. If MSNBC decides that um, there's an audience for liberal uh, points of view, then they'll do that. If, if suddenly tomorrow there were no more liberals, MSNBC would be doing conservative commentary. And the same goes for Fox News Channel. If no, no more conservatives tomorrow, Fox News Channel would be all liberal. Um, so, but in that respect, um, there's also a, a bias towards um, artificial balance, where the, the news media routinely overreacts to uh, labels, uh, oftentimes thrown around, uh, well, this, the particular liberal media news bias uh, was created in the late 60s um, to attack, uh, to, to basically shame the news media into not reporting reality. Stephen Colbert has a great quote. Uh, he said, uh, reality has a well-known liberal bias. And that's what the news media was driven by for many, many years, pursuing the truth. And obviously there were aberrations in their yellow media and tabloid journalism. But once, um, once the profit motive entered uh, the news media, whatever sold the most advertising time, that was the news that was reported. And that's inherently dangerous. So, um, but insofar as um, the, the artificial balance that's created, the reaction is to the audience. The audience says, wow, this news sounds really liberal, when in fact it, that's just the way the news works out. If, um, you, you know, you, you can't have a, one guy on saying the sky is blue and then another guy on saying the sky is brown. There's, that's, that's false. <laughs> that's not, that's not uh, accurate. So, uh, you know, th there's, there's so much, um, there's so many false accusations against the news media, and the liberal media bias is a major, major one. David Brock wrote a great book. He was a conservative media consultant for a long time and uh, escaped from that and then founded Media Matters. And he wrote a book entirely about how uh, the sort of the rise of what David Frum calls the conservative, the conservative entertainment complex, which has uh, become this, uh, this massively uh, entrenched uh, takeover of, well, in all of AM talk radio. I always, I always think it's hilarious when I hear the media has a liberal bias when the most popular cable news network is entirely conservative, where conservatives control almost every AM radio station 
in America. I mean, thousands of talk show hosts with syndication in multiple markets and multiple radio stations and corporations owning those stations uh, in every single market. You cannot turn on the AM dial without hearing uh, a conservative talk radio host. So it's completely ridiculous. And I think social media has exposed a lot of that, thankfully. Dr. King touched on this earlier um, about there being two sides to a six-sided story. The bottom line is that tr the traditional media now believes that there's two sides to every story. Every story. Yeah. And it's honestly, it's just freaking lazy. It really is. Because it's not your job as a journalist to say, well, the Democrats say this and the Republicans say that. It's your job to say what the freaking truth is. It's your job to, you know, you have to find out and you have to tell us, okay, I'm glad they're saying that. I'm glad this side's saying that, that other side's saying that. What's the truth? What's the reality? And don't worry about which side you know, which side politically it comes down on, that doesn't matter. It's absolutely meaningless. What matters is the truth. That's the job of a journalist. And to kind of either not, you know, pussyfoot around it and give spin from one side or the other, or to pretend that, uh, that there is no truth, or pawn it off on fact checkers. I love it when they do that now. That's the new thing is, you know, the New York Times. We ran it past the fact checkers at Annenberg Political Fact Checker. Like, no, you know what? You're the fact checkers. You're a journalist. Your job is to check facts. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really offensive. It is, because it does turn into, okay, well, here's both sides of the issue, and we're going to let these two people duke it out on television, or we're going to, you know, give them columns on CNN.com or whatever. I think largely sometimes it turns into a situation where journalists are really stenographers mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. because they're just simply going through the Rolodex, finding uh, two opposing viewpoints and serving as a conduit for and those they, sources. And they, do, and they do that. They will yeah. actually go, okay, you know what, I'm a segment producer. I'm going to, uh, we need, the, we've got this person on. Okay, now we need the exact opposite, you know, to come on and, and basically present this, this horseshit balance, which doesn't really exist. And I think the other piece of evidence that it's not a liberal media, if you look at the uh, endorsement patterns in newspapers over elections, they're almost overwhelmingly uh, support the conservative candidate with few exceptions because <clears throat> newspapers are corporations. They're very much profit driven and they're very much driven by stockholders uh, in many cases. And they tend to endorse the Republican candidates. One thing Chez and I have disagreed about and debated extensively is the um, is the position of MSNBC as a as a so-called or having a so-called pro-Obama bias, and my my argument against that is for three plus hours every morning you have a show on MSNBC that's hosted by a conservative, a former Republican congressman. And it's, it's difficult to find it. Um, if, if, for example, the, the, we were talking about the uh, uh, reality having a liberal bias, uh, sometimes reality has an Obama bias. And if you report on that, do you have a bias or are you just reporting the news? And uh, so I think... Uh, Th that's an interesting subdivision of the Didn't Axel Robin Gibbs put you in your place on that? <laughs> yeah, I was proven wrong, I, you know, um, in a certain way, because MSNBC went out and hired David Axelrod and Robert Gibbs, which, thank you very much, MSNBC, for making me look like an idiot. Um, this is for Chez. You've been a blogger uh, for quite a while, and obviously you've gotten... Uh, a lot of attention, both positive and some negative, on articles you've written. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, some of the, the negative reaction and has it gotten worse since you started? As an overall, um, basically, has the internet gotten more vicious? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a free-for-all now. The internet is not interested in nuance. It's cacophony. It's yelling and screaming and doing it anonymously. and. I mean, and that's, that's actually one of the problems that, that I, kind of, I kind of have is that, is that everybody gets, you know, kind of like the meme thing and, and everyone gets fixated on one thing and what they do is they just yell about it, you know, and after a while it becomes so loud that no, there's no nuance heard at all because if, you know, like in every other form of media, in social media the extremist position, you know, trolling, that's what gets people to read and that's what gets people to listen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've drawn plenty of fire for the things that I've written and, you know, I mean, I, I stand by 99% of it. I've gone back and said plenty of times, like, no, I didn't, I made this mistake, this wasn't right. But, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's vicious, it really is. It's, um, 
it's a lot of it's a lot of real serious righteous anger out there and the internet gives voice to which you know kind of like Vanessa said a while ago about um you know there's there's I always worry when I hear you know the Komen thing was was a great example because that was some that was the internet rising up and saying look this is a bad idea and we want you know we want something done about it and, it and a lot of good came from it but I always whenever I see that I'm always terrified because I think what happens when somebody you know when a couple of people who are really savvy when it comes to using the you know the internet what happens when they decide that something that really doesn't deserve to be taken down down should be taken down and then it turns into you know a lot of screaming and a lot of you know I've written a lot lately about sort of the age of outrage and I feel like the internet has really created that it's an age where where when you get upset, you can voice, put your voice out there to the world, and you know, if people don't pay attention, they don't read on their own, you can get people angry about anything really easily. You know, you put a post up on Facebook, can you believe this happened? And like, people who don't bother to actually read what's going on and read the details of the story will go, oh my god, you're so right. Oh, I'm, I'm furious about that, and now I'm going to be a slacktivist, and I'm going to send one tweet off in this direction. And if enough people start doing that, I just, that's the thing, I feel like it's the double-edged sword thing that you brought up, that there's good and bad, that, you know, you never know when it's gonna, when it's gonna kind of be used for nefarious purposes. Right. Um, because all that anger will go somewhere, and it will make, you know, it will make changes, and I feel like I always worry that, that the immediacy is such a great, great thing for the internet, but by the same token, we're, we're becoming a nation of knee-jerks. You know, mm -hmm. we just respond like that. And we don't bother, even sometimes, we don't even bother thinking about what it is we're responding to. We just, all right, you know what, this person said something that offends me, and oh my God, I'm so angry about that, and it just turns into a lot of yelling and screaming. Right, I mean, I think that, um, but I think the difference between what you're saying and, and a lot of I f what I feel like you guys are talking about is like people wanting to be turned on, right? Is like wanting to be turned on or like, by something, and, and sometimes that can be like, yeah, this makes me angry, but I do feel like the Komen story and a lot, and a lot of particularly the conversations online that happen, you know, leading up to the election um, around the, the war on women, right, I think was uh, not necessarily from coming from that place, but coming from a more uh, personal place, right? And how, you know, uh, the internet, it just allows us, right, to share our stories with one another. And so much of the online dialogue that came from Komen and came from um, a, a lot of, you know, all, Todd, Todd Aiken's comments about rape and abortion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's those, great that the internet were, was able to publicize that. It was terrific. Yeah, that, that I just... So many of the stories and the people that talked about that online were talking, you know, from their own personal experiences and, and from, you know, one of the, uh, a Tumblr was created, um, which was a really, I think, a, a, a definitely a really big uh, part of what Komen, why Komen reversed their de de decision. My friend Deanna Zant, she's an online strategist, created this Tumblr called Planned Parenthood Save Me. And it basically, you know, prompted uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, of people to submit stories of how Planned Parenthood saved them. And I think that, you know, so I think that it's just important to also talk about the storytelling piece and of online activism and, and, and using social media to create social change in that way and how I think that that personal piece is something that, you know, shouldn't be, you know, should definitely be counted in that in that conversation. Right. Again, it. I mean, that's, that's a, a, such a good example of something that's really, really important. Right. But I kind of feel uh, a lot of times, I mean, I do, uh, it's funny, I do a lot of complaining about outrage, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, which I know is completely ironic. I suck. Totally. Um, but I do feel sort of like, you know, what John Stewart says, if we amplify everything, we hear nothing. And it's gotten to the point now where we get so angry so quickly and we voice it so, again, such, such a knee-jerk reaction and it, and it can become so loud that really, I mean, I get it, it's not my position to decide what's worth getting upset over and what isn't, mm -hmm. but, you know, you, it kind of becomes after a while difficult to separate the really serious stuff from the, oh my God, I'm just, it's Tuesday, so I'm pissed off. <laughs> you know, what, what new do I have to be angry about? Sure. Oh, you know what, this person just tweeted that at me and I can't believe this happened and I'm going to get angry. 
I, yeah, isn't that the basic nature of politics, though, at least in terms of activism and, and voter participation? I mean, that's, being angry about an issue is what motivates people to become active about it. And I think... But knee-jerk anger without looking into what's really going on, and I feel but, like... But, but there is, there, I think there's always been knee-jerk anger. I think it's more visible now because there's, there, there's an opportunity and a bigger platform to voice that knee-jerk anger rather than just, you know, stewing at it at the end of a bar people now can go there and talk, talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, 150 years ago, there was a civil war. And it, it, that is uh, sort of the epitome of knee-jerk anger, where we could no longer um, maintain our, our tempers about things, and it exacerbated into um, 600,000 dead Americans. So I think, um, and obviously for a very good cause, but I mean, this is, and there are lots of good causes. So I think with every um, negative thing, that, or every um, unnecessary display of outrage, you've got a lot of necessary ones that turn into activism and right. positive I mean, you change. I know that you can't really cut one off without cutting off the other. And again, I'm, I'm the first one to say I know, like I, like I said, I've written a lot about outrage lately because it ironically outrages me. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I know that it's not my place to decide what people get angry about and what they don't get angry about. But, you know, you do kind of see, I just feel like you do see so much now of people just losing their mind on the internet over really, you know, things that, that maybe they're, you know, they're somewhat offensive or something like that, but they're not really in the great scheme of things that big a deal. And it just really gets, it can get, I mean, it gets really loud and really angry out there. And I had a question I wanted to ask the panel real quickly. That uh, I'm thinking about the, how the communication is accelerated because of social media. And we had uh, sexual harassment charges against uh, Herman Cain this year. How would you contrast that with Bill Clinton's experience with that. I mean, what, what would that have been like if Clinton were a candidate oh, in 2012? <laughs> how, how is it? I mean, came because the shelf life on Herman came, I mean, he withered on the vine, what, mm -hmm. two weeks after it hit? Yeah. It's, it's difficult to, to know for sure because I think um, in a lot of ways sex scandals aren't as uh, damaging as they used to be. I guess it all depends on the circumstances. If you put Bill Clinton uh, in this exact same scenario as Herman Cain, first of all, he'd be a major, he'd be a bigger idiot than he was with... You know what I'd actually uh, argue, though? I'd actually argue that not only are sex scandals not as big as they used to be, but no scandal is because our attention span will move past it. You can I don't get, know. You I mean, there, there, anything. there are a lot of people. I mean, Anthony Weiner uh, was Anthony crushed Weiner, last year. Anthony John Weiner, Edwards. Anthony Weiner chose to give up. If, yeah. he, if he had, I said this a long time ago, if he had stuck at it, eventually people would have forgotten. That's it. true. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying that we would have moved on to something else. We would have found something else to occupy our time. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's already off topic here, but he's already, Wiener's a really good example of somebody who's going through kind of the, uh, the sort of media sensation celebrity, you know, cycle, which is vilified. Um, you know, uh, picked on, you know, and then he's coming up on redemption now. He's going to run for mayor in New York City. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's just, it's the way things work now. We, we lose, you know, we don't, nothing sticks with us for too long, even a scandal. I just want to add that the comparison, too, is it's important to, to note that the Herman Cain situation, sexual harassment is not sex scandal, you know what I mean? I so, yeah. like, the, the Clinton thing, that's where the differentiation yes. is pretty big there. Yeah. It just seems that it's accelerated now. Any kind yeah. of scandal is accelerated. Oh, yeah. Would you elaborate on that uh, further, on the difference? Um, uh, well, uh, basically what Clinton, uh, Clinton and Monica Lewinsky was consensual. <laughs> um, so what happened there was an actual sex scandal, and with Herman Cain, there was an actual sexual harassment. So, yeah. Um, and also, Vanessa, um, gay marriage and reproductive rights were both issues that gained national attention in the last election. Um, what role did social media play in moving these issues to like the national stage? Um, yeah, I think it uh, played an enormous issue. I mean, you're talking to an, an online evangelist, so I mean, I would even take it a step further. I think that, I mean, I really think that social media and uh, the the conversation on social media are like 
bringing uh, reproductive rights in particular to light um, actually played a really big impact on the outcome of the election. Um, and I think it's important to, to bring that up. Um, you know, it was really fascinating for me as um, an online strategist um, and blogger for that matter to really watch how these kinds of these moments unfolded right over the course of the year between you know Komen happening and then Sandra Fluke right um, testified before Congress shortly thereafter Rush Limbaugh called her a slut on his show um, after which you know there was this uh, outrage online which resulted in 141 companies pulling their support um, from his show um, and then, like, I think it was less than two months after that, uh, the Obama campaign made a very deliberate um, decision to focus on women's health. And David Axelrod is on the record saying this, saying in May we started focusing on women's health and, uh, you know, uh, uh, economic issues for women. And um, it was something that they had focused on throughout for the rest of, of uh, the election season. And we had a record, you know, uh, record numbers when it came to the, the uh, woman coming out. I think we had a majority in the electorate were women, um, and there was a record in terms of the general vote too. So, you know, uh, I think that it, it, I think that those conversations that happen and, um, and, and all of those pieces, right? So even though they were kind of immediate in the way that they unfolded, I think over the course of that year, it really, made a, there was a cultural shift and there was a shift, you know, uh, uh, of the op uh, opinion of women across the country uh, around it that really kind of galvanized them to, to go vote. So I think, um, I think that that was a really powerful, a really powerful piece of it. This is for Dr. King. How has social media been an avenue in terms of reporting significant international events as they happen in real time? What impact has this had? Well, I think, uh, to me, the best example is the Arab Spring. Uh, and having lived in the Middle East for uh, one year and having traveled there many times, uh, I can tell you that most of the people I know there really value democratic values, really value the freedoms that we have. And I don't think they would have been able to, to carry out the kind of uh, protests they did without social media. It just wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, when I was at Al Jazeera, I was at a research forum. I met uh, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley who, uh, when the protests started happening in Myanmar, Burma, uh, they parachuted satellite phones into that country, I think about 250 satellite phones, so that people could record what was happening there and get that message out. I think. I think uh, nations have more difficulty controlling information than ever before because of those kinds of things. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, but on the other hand, there have been situations in other countries uh, in the Gulf, uh, UAE in particular, where there were bloggers who were uh, demanding reforms and they were summarily arrested and shipped off to an undisclosed location and barely heard from again, but there were bloggers around the world, including in this country, who advocated for them. Uh, and uh, the other thing I've seen is that just the understanding of culture and the understanding of political processes and understanding of uh, democratic processes, uh, especially popular culture, though, has been really intensified by social media. Um, I'm, I'm in contact with about 40 or 50 of my former students from uh, Dubai, and they're tweeting and Facebooking about every kind of uh, uh, celebrity. Kim Kardashian is huge in the Middle East, and South Park is a number one show there, for example. And, but they know about our, more about our political process than we do sometimes, I think, uh, because they've studied it, and they really aspire to it. And, I just don't think you would have had these kind of movements without social media. I just don't think it would have happened otherwise. Um, and Bob, uh, during the last election cycle, did social, did social media affect the strategy of the two major political parties? And can you cite specific examples? Yeah, I think um, with the Obama campaign, they really tapped Facebook 
this year or last year. And um, the way they did that was they were able to, if you clicked like on any one post that they added to Facebook, you would then be automatically, I think, subscribed to their entire feed. So they were able to get their message out through Facebook in a, in a huge way. I don't know that they were that comprehensive with Twitter, um, but I still think we're sort of at the infancy of the use of social media in campaigns, and I think that was a huge step forward. And I, it, uh, I, I think it's just a matter of time now before that goes all the way down to um, the state and local level as well. Um, but um, that said, I, 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 I think a lot of campaigns, a lot of especially old school politicians, still see it as kind of a toy. I don't know if any of you follow or have seen any tweets by Chuck Grassley, uh, the senator, and they're utterly ridiculous. Like sometimes he'll just tweet his own name for some reason. Like, and, and everyone will retweet it. Which maybe it's some maybe he's crazy like a fox. Everyone retweets his stuff because they make no sense. He'll he'll like tweet an ellipses for some reason. Um, so, but I mean that's just a, an extreme example. I think a lot of uh, older politicians just don't know what to make of it because I think um, they barely use it. And then um, I think other older politicians will just hire someone to throw whatever press release. Uh, they've constructed that day out into the into the field. So um, it's still really, really early as far as using it goes. This is for Chez. How is cable news in particular trying to cash in on social media, and is it effective? Um, for a long time, cable news didn't understand social media. I know because I'm a victim of it, or was a victim of it. You know, in 2008, I got can by CNN, and uh, the reason is because I maintain a personal blog on the side. Now, you know, uh, a debate can be had over whether that's respectable for a journalist to do, whether it's ethical to sort of voice your opinion, um, you know, as a journalist. But obviously now it's not that big a deal because CNN basically allows their, on, especially their on-air talent, to go ahead and say whatever they want on Twitter. And, and usually it's, um, uh, usually it's, it's sort of uh, without any sort of punishment until, oddly enough, when they cross the line, and they do once in a while. Um, but for a long time, it was, and cable really didn't understand uh, new media. They really didn't. They didn't get the sort of, first of all, they, uh, you know, they tried to control it, which was a real problem, because the thing about new media is that it makes things transparent. Um, you know, you can't sort of BS people as easily as you used to be able to. And I think the model of cable news was, all right, we're going to control our brand. We're going to control our message. We're going to control, you know, we're keeping a very tight grip on sort of how people see CNN, NBC, or whatever. And the thing about social media is that it's much more free form. Um, and that was very, very difficult for them to get their head around. The other thing was, I mean, unless you're, you know, unless you're Tosh, what's on the internet doesn't translate really well into what's on TV. It's very hard for you to sort of get a grasp of that, the sort of chaos that is the, you know, the, the good chaos that is the internet and make it work for you on TV. But now I think more than ever, um, yeah, um, there are a lot more cable news shows that actually use, um, use Twitter, use Facebook, and, and do it pretty well, you know. But I mean, the problem with it is, is that in order to make it work, you have to give the people doing it freedom. You've got to basically, because one of the things that, that uh, uh, I think Cable sort of learned early on is that nobody's going to tune in if, if, you know, the only tweets that they're getting from, uh, you know, from cable news people are, oh, you know, to tune in to me at 4 o'clock today and I'll be interviewing this person. That's not, you know, yeah. you... Yeah, you got to add. Yeah, you have to actually have something to say, and you have to express your opinion. And for a long time, that was a really, again, I know, was a really big deal with cable. They didn't like the idea of their, you know, they, they held on to the old school, you know, paradigm that you don't express your opinion. And so that was, yeah, I mean, that was a real problem. But I think that, I think it's evolved in just, my God, just the, you know, just the five years since I left CNN. I mean, they've evolved quite a bit. Um, you know, even just a couple of years ago, as, as, much as, um, as much as he catches a lot of crap, and he and I go way, way back, we started our, I started my career with him, Rick Sanchez on uh, CNN. He was really good at tapping into uh, the sort of new media zeitgeist. His entire show was about Twitter, and, you know, we had people contact him, and he would read it. And, I mean, that was the, that was the whole 
purpose of his show. And actually, you know, for, for all the, the crap that he catches, he actually did a really good show by doing that. He got it. He understood. And more and more you're going to see people who, who, you know, more and more you're going to see people who are doing that, who, who sort of get what new media is and understand how to use it properly. Yeah, I've actually found that Twitter is a great tool for both criticizing and shaming traditional media people, um, which I, I routinely do. I don't know why I have this thing about Chuck Todd, but I routinely will go just, just go after Chuck Todd mercilessly on Twitter because I know he'll see it. And at no other time in the history of the press can you have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, that one-on-one -on -one criticism of someone who is utterly insufferable? <laughs> you know, I mean, well, my, my main issue with Chuck Todd is he treats politics as if it's a sport. And it's not a sport. It's a serious thing that has serious impact on a Bell lot of people. Ballway thinking. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, I mean, every time he does that, every time he compares uh, politics to baseball or football or, you know, a particular game... I take to Twitter, and I will not let go until he has banned me or blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> so, uh, in that respect, it's, such an asshole. it's fantastic. <laughs> but I think it also it does speak to this. Um, it also does speak to the power of social media and blogging, and how it allows for this uh, accountability to media stakeholders in this really big way. And at least in the feminist blogosphere, I feel like we've been um, pretty effective and kind of pointing out when uh, folks make mistakes, right? Um, there are, you know, if you see a, a, a headline that's very slut-shaming or victim-blaming, um, you know, reaching out to them or blogging about it and having your readers, you know, call into to the paper to get the headline removed, which we've, we've had done. Um, the New York Times, uh, uh, there was a a story a couple of years ago about a 11-year-old girl who was raped and uh, gang raped. And the story actually had a really, um, really bizarre kind of um, uh, way that they reported it and the people that they quoted in it talking about how she wore a lot of makeup and you know, hung out with the older boys at school all the time um, and talking about how it was so terrible that uh, this had happened to the community. But there was literally, I mean, they were literally kind of basically saying that this girl, the way that she dressed, the way that she wore makeup, the way that she hung out with these boys, she was 11 years old. So uh, there was a huge um, online campaign basically through blogging. Again, this is all ad hoc. So much of these campaigns um, are not, you know, it just happens at the moment and everyone just comes together. Um, and they ended up writing a follow-up piece apologizing for it and saying that it was, that, it, that they, they, it basically was their bad. So I do think that there is a lot of power in that kind of um, accountability that we can have with the media to help them to be better reporters, to be um, uh, more uh, justice-oriented and not, you know, not use uh, offensive language to communities of folks, so. Um, this last question is for Vanessa. Um, while the internet is an open forum for engagement, um, the anonymity it allows, creates um, a lack of accountability. Does this inherent detachment lead to increased preju prejudicial behavior and what specifics have you experienced and how can that be rectified? Oh, I've experienced a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, no, of course. I mean, listen, we're gonna have the same isms online that we have offline and the anonymity of the internet um, can often allow it. Uh, even more so. Uh, yeah, we've definitely had a lot of experience at Feministing, um, uh, you know, particularly in our comments sections. We ended up uh, having, now we moderate all of our comments individually, which is, again, speaks to the su sustainability issues because we can't afford a community moderator, so we basically have to do it ourselves, which in turn allows comments not to be published, like right then and there, maybe a half hour at a time, so our comment sections are not nearly as vibrant as they used to be, but um, it basically, I think we decided to do that after it was like our three-year anniversary of feministing. We were having a party in the city and my sister had to leave in the middle of the party to go moderate, like, so some misogynist site had sent over a bunch of, um, trolls, we call them, to, uh, 
basically just comment hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments on all of our posts, mostly regurgitations of the uh, ever creative line, make me a sandwich. Um, so, you know, we've had that, you know, kind of very, you know, aggravating, disruptive kind of trolling, and then we've, you know, had very severe threats, um, had to call the FBI uh, folks, uh, you know, getting information, of, personal information about where we live, posting it um, on other uh, misogynist sites. So it, it can be really scary um, at times, um, but I think, you know, there are ways, obviously, by contacting the FBI and you know, um, protecting ourselves and moderating comments to make sure that our readers have a safe community. Um, but, and there's also other kind of more creative ways that you can kind of hold folks accountable. There actually are ways you could hold them accountable while not everyone necessarily, even though we have called out a couple of people individually when we figured out who they are, they would like mistakenly like totally expose their, you know, their name and what school they went to and anyway. Um, but for folks, for most of the folks who are anonymous, we actually created this uh, series on the blog, an anti-feminist mailbag series, because we got so much hate mail. We basically had our own folder, like in each of our inboxes for hate mail. Um, but we decided, like, we were looking, like, would read them and send them to each other, because so many of them were hilarious, you know, they were just so ridiculous. So we were like, we should just start posting this on the blog. So we started posting on the blog and I think that it was kind of awesome because one, I mean, it allowed our readers to like show support. Um, but it also was this kind of public shaming. I mean, even though their names, right, weren't there, I think that it, I think that it was effective and it was also a way to really bring humor to it and just the ridiculousness, because these guys, they're trying to make you angry, you know, and I think that um, the, the last thing that you want to do is show them that they are. Um, another really striking example um, that, that I um, know about is a friend of mine, Anita Sarkeesian. She's a video blogger. Um, she was creating a Kickstarter, which is basically like an online fundraising drive for this um, this project that she wanted to create a video series um, basically analyzing the representations of women in video games. So she created this Kickstarter and the gaming community online and a bunch of, you know, these, these dudes got really angry and so angry that they um, started harassing her in really, really violent ways. They hacked her Wikipedia page. They posted pictures, uh, pornographic pictures of her being raped. They literally created an online video game of a picture of her where people could click on her face and bruises would show up on her face. It was called Beat Up Anita Sarkeesian. Um, so obviously this was a really traumatic experience for her, but her community as well as a number of people in the gaming community who were horrified at this you know, reaction and this harassment of her um, got together and basically started donating to, to the Kickstarter. So her goal, uh, her goal of the Kickstarter was $6,000. She ended up raising $160,000. So, I mean, while, you know, I tell the story, she actually doesn't like to talk too much at least about the money that was raised because she doesn't want, she's like, nothing, that is not any kind of reward for what, I experienced and I would totally give it back if I couldn't experience um, what happened to her. But I think that um, it's a really, really important story because it's a testament of the power of online community and that I really believe that as much hate as there is on the internet, I think that um, there are more, you know, there's more positive communities of support that are really out there trying to do good. So it's comforting. Okay, um, we're going to have a brief uh, question and answer period uh, for our panelists. So if you have any questions, I know it's a little daunting, but please feel free to come up to the mic and uh, our panelists will be happy to answer anything you got for them. My question is for uh, just the Houston Division. I was wondering, what are your perspectives and opinions on the Bradley Mann case and the WikiLeaks trial? And whether that was meant to be right or American hacks I guess I'll start because I might not have the most popular opinion in the room about this, but because I, I, I think um, 
I think it would have been great um, if he had gotten away with it. Um, because we needed to know that information. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time... Sorry, can you give a background on it, just so everybody knows? Oh, okay. Well, um, Bradley Manning is accused... He's a, um, a service member who was accused of leaking information to the website WikiLeaks, uh, detailing um, a, a wide variety of information, classified information about the Iraq War. And um, they uh, somehow were able to ascertain that he was the one who was doing it. And then they arrested him. And now he's in basically solitary confinement. Um, and he, I don't think he's been, he's been formally charged. Or uh, has he not even, I mean, yeah, there's no trial date. There's no, there's no information. I mean, the, the whole idea of a speedy trial has sort of been um, left by the wayside. But at the same time, um, uh, you know, while it, it was valuable to learn this information, the risk that he took, if he did in fact do this, um, carried with it the, the penalty of violating the National Security Act. And I think in, in that respect, I think it's an important piece of legislation. Obviously, maintaining national secrets is also important. Um, but if they do get out and you get away with it, that's also important as well. Um, it's kind of a nuanced position, I know, uh, but, um, uh, but I, I feel as if if you're going to take that chance, you have to be prepared to be caught and then prosecuted. I, I don't necessarily agree with how they're going about it um, the, the, in terms of the, you know, uh, keeping him in, in solitary confinement and, uh, and not charging him and not putting him on trial yet. I feel like they're kind of setting him out there as an example and, uh, and, and, and not necessarily doing any justice in the process. It seems like the uh, 21st century version of the Pentagon Papers to me. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, and yeah. It's Julian Daniel Ellsberg yeah. himself is uh, he's in exile, I think, and is uh, yeah. We have a graduate student here who's doing her thesis on this. Uh, uh, you know, is he a hero or is he a villain? And I think uh, time will tell how the world interprets that. Yeah, I mean, the distinction is whether or not you get caught in a lot of these things. Yeah. Like, um, Lance Armstrong got caught doping. Um, before he was caught doping, he was a hero. Once he got caught, he was a villain. So, uh, I, I, I don't know how I would compare Lance Armstrong to Bradley Manning, but I somehow did that. <laughs> I should probably even stay out of this because I, I don't care about the Bradley Manning story. I think Julian Assange is a pompous ass. I think he's done some good, but he obviously has, you know, he has an issue with America, which, you know, is very fair. Um, but I don't know. I just, I have, a, I have a limited, the people who get very, very angry about uh, Bradley Manning and Bradley Manning's treatment, you know, he is a guy, yes, he did, you know, he did divulge state secrets, whether we needed to know it or not. Um, I, I, my, my, my reservoir of, I always say, my reservoir of outrage is very limited. And so I have to pick and choose what I decide I'm going to spend that reservoir on. And it stops around Brad, Bradley Manning. I should probably care more, but I, I just don't. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I would probably say I agree um, with Bob but a little bit. I mean, I don't, I, I, and I, would, I don't know if you guys know in terms of his solitary confinement and what human rights violations are actually being, I mean, it seems it's, to me it's hard to that know, it's yeah. pretty, yeah, but that in itself is the most terrifying thing to me. And it is really like, and it, it is terrifying. And I think that the way that they've handled it has been kind of, um, kind of terrible. I mean, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see what actually happens and when we're going to know exactly what the deal is because I think that the longer he's in this, you know, um, I, I just think the, the more possibility that there are severe human rights violations happening that is just not what this country is supposed to be about and I think that's problematic. Uh, I have also a question about other states. This one right now, I might ask that if we have time. Um, I'm actually really curious on all of your opinions on the actual pressure that the population on social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, have on congressmen and senators. Whereas nowadays, every I mean, every congressman and his brother has a Twitter. They all use it. 
uh, whether it's for comical needs or it's actually for important uh, debates that are happening, um, so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people follow them, uh, comment some trolls, some of them actually try to pressure them into siding a certain way on the bills. And I was wondering what you think, if anything, that actually does, because personally I've seen very little effect come from it. Um, but I'm curious as to what you all think. Uh, I, I think that uh the one really, really important effect of social media, new media, on politics is traditional press rarely covers, and I should say the traditional national press, rarely covers state politics. And whereas social media is much more uh, closely attuned to state politics, especially and most importantly now. Um, last year, uh, in Virginia, they were getting ready to pass one of these anti-abortion laws involving a transvaginal ultrasound. Social media went nuts, where the traditional press wasn't even really paying attention. There was no mention of it on cable news until social media went nuts about it, and rightfully so. The consequence of it was that the traditional press picked up on this story, and what had ended up happening was the Virginia legislature and the governor dropped the transvaginal ultrasound part of it. I think maybe the ultrasound, there's still an ultrasound, but it's not an invasive ultrasound. So it's not an outright, it's not a full victory of getting rid of this intimidation factor, but it was, um, it was a marginal victory, I think, and that had entirely to do with social media paying attention to state politics. And I think more of that needs to happen because um, we were discussing earlier about how the Republican Party might seem as if it's in disarray and, um, you know, sort of uh, becoming an antique. But I think at the state level, the Republican Party is more powerful than ever. I think uh, what they're doing at the state level, whether it's voter ID laws, whether it's monkeying around with the electoral vote system, or whether it's the war on women, um, a lot of really, really bad things are going through state legislatures because I think the Republicans were prescient enough to know that maybe they won't win every presidential election, but if they control the school boards and if they control the local municipalities and if they control the state houses, they can get a lot more done and they can get it done under the radar, which is kind of scary. And, and to that end, what, if anything, can the populace of social media do about Don't give up. Just keep going. Uh, uh, you shame enough politicians and shame enough members of the traditional press, eventually they're really going to start to pay attention to everything. And it's already started. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. I think that the election, that this past election was a pretty strong example. If you look at Todd Aiken and Richard Murdoch, I mean, and the other guy, you know, folks that, who had made those terrible comments, um, they lost their race, right? And there's, I don't think it's a coincidence that they lost their race after the social media around it. And I think that what Bob said is, is a really big, is a really big piece. I think social media around specific um, legislators is, is their impact on the media. Um, so I think there is, that's a big piece. I think that, um, I think that you can affect legislation through social media, th so through Twitter, so you can, whether it be promoting, you know, legislation or fighting against it. I think that in terms of connecting with 
legislators that who are on Twitter, I agree, I don't think is super, I mean, I think that it depends if the media picks up on it, right? If the media picks up on, on you know, a million tweets to, you know, Senator so-and-so, I think that that will make an effect, but at least folks that I know who've worked, you know, on the Hill basically say that the most effective way to reach local legislative offices is um, mail, is actually physical mail. Um, so I think that you can use there, but there are fun ways that you can use social media to, to reach those folks by, you know, maybe starting some kind of hashtag campaign to get, I think that there was actually one, and this is going to be really cr crude, but I think there was one that was criminalizing, there was a legislation, but this was legislation, not uh, but, but either way, no, but it was targeting a legislator, but it was legislation uh, that was going to uh, criminalize, like, a potentially criminalize miscarriage. So a bunch of this hashtag campaign, social media campaign, ended up having hundreds, I think, of tampons sent to this legislator's office. So, like, that is a really, and it's really creative, and it got a lot of media attention, and it obviously, I'm sure, the legislator was not thrilled to have hundreds of tampons sent to their office. So I think that that is kind of the way I agree that I don't, I mean, they're, they're not, most of the time, they're not the ones behind that Twitter handle, so. I think it really boils down to uh, how do these legislators gauge public opinion? Do they listen to lobbyists and contributors, which is, seems to be the pattern quite, quite often? Mm -hmm. uh, and it also boils down to whether uh, Twitter activity, for example, is perceived as a true grassroots upswelling of public opinion or if it's more astroturf which is simply manufactured consent from special interests. I think that's, uh, I think we may get to a point where uh, the ability to track these things is so commonplace that legislators might start paying more attention. Well, you if can, they perceive it as being a, a groundswell of, of public opinion. The thing about, about social media is that you have the ability with it, you know, and, and if, certainly if you get enough people going in one direction, you have the ability to change the narrative. You know, and if you, if you change the national narrative and there are politicians who see that, who see that there is this, this groundswell of something bubbling up underneath them, then yeah, they'll, uh, that will help to change their opinions. It will be sort of impossible to deny. And you know, a really interesting thing is that um, this whole uh, traditional media paying attention to new media, that's a relatively new thing. Because for the longest time, traditional media was this arrogant freaking dinosaur that was just, you know, God forbid they listened to bloggers or people on Twitter or anything like that. As far as they were concerned, um, you know, news was disseminated down. It didn't percolate up from the bottom. You know, as far as they were concerned, people who were bloggers were, you know, little gnats that they kind of had to swat away. And now it's, it's very different. I mean, you know, Twitter it really can, especially Twitter and Facebook, can really be, they can provide a, a um, you know, break stories and provide a sort of consensus opinion that, that the larger media organizations will absolutely pay attention to because they have no choice. They have, they have to. You know, it's a, you know, it's a finger on the pulse. I just want to say one other thing. I think that you see evidence of this in the corporate world when an airline leaves passengers stranded on a tarmac for three hours with overflowing toilets and things. All it takes is a couple of people on that plane to Twitter about it, and they have to respond to it. Bob and I were it, stuck know. in Chicago yesterday. Uh, yeah. And I think maybe, hopefully, that will translate in the political realm eventually. Yeah. But I also wonder if it's not a place for the in the sense of, of moderating well, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone has thoughts on this, but I just do want to point out before we talk about it, I think it's important to uh, bring up the fact that, um, that blogging has changed traditional media, right? So their media has changed. I think the media landscape has changed in a big way. I mean, if you go to abcnews.com, if you go to New York Times, for that matter, I mean, they have comment sections, right? They have blogs. Um, so I think it's important to, to kind of think about the ways that um, these kinds of things, they're coming together in a lot of ways, I think, uh, and that may happen down the line that, you know, it's not about blogs or, or traditional media anymore. Um, and I think um, on the same note, just in terms of fact checking, you know, I think that, you know, blogs, if you think about it, and there are so many, you know, Huffington Post, for example, a lot of folks would not consider Huffington Post a blog. So I think that it's just, it's important to, to not necessarily look at it in this, like, in this way of like one or the other, um, and, and especially becoming helpful to you in terms of what you're thinking about and this kind of new, because I think that that is already kind of happening in a lot of ways. 
there's a, there's a fascinating sort of cross-current dynamic occurring um, with new media where a lot of the traditional media is um, is engaging in blogging and, and trying to be more like new media, but actually a lot of um, websites that began as blogs are evolving into hard news sites. Josh Marshall's Talking Points memo yeah. Yeah. is a great example. I mean, that was just Josh blogging every day, and now he's gone out and hustled and, and attained the, uh, the investors to actually create a legitimate news source that is one of the maybe the top five blogs that I look at every day, multiple times a day, and it's um, it's, it's it's fascinating to see as blogs become closer to, to traditional media in terms of hard reporting, and traditional media comes tries to evolve more like new media. What's going to happen when they when they eventually meet and cross paths, are we eventually going to have, I think we're eventually, I mean, within the next five years, maybe we'll have a lot more talking points memo style sites, which will be extraordinarily refreshing as an alternative to the traditional press. Yeah, and then you get to pick, you know, it's your decision as to who you trust and who you don't trust. And that's, that's one of the problems, because for so long we've had, you know, Maybe, maybe you trust CNN, maybe you don't, but at least you knew what sort of the, the big news outlets were, and you made the decision, okay, look, you know, I know I'm, I'm at least getting some, you know, some good news from these people. And now it's like, yeah, you know what, you have to sort of, there's so many different media outlets out there, you've got to kind of be vigilant about, you know, getting your information and deciding what you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe and who might be biased and who might not be biased. I'll tell you, though, the... Um, you know, not to bring business into it, but it's true. The real trick for journalists is going to be getting paid. Yeah. Because that's really, really, you know, it sounds, uh, it, you know, it, it sounds very, um, very sort of, you know, uh, uh, not very high-minded, but, you know, it's your life you're talking about. You've got to pay the rent. You know, you've got to pay mortgage. You've got to have a life. And one of the problems with new media, with the rise of it, is that so many people, you know, the new model, you know, I write for the Huffington Post, and I'm the first one to say, you know, everybody knows HuffPo doesn't pay. HuffPo doesn't pay its bloggers. And they've come up with a, a brilliant business strategy for them that's not so, sometimes not so great for everybody else, which is, well, we're giving you tons of exposure. We're giving you, you know, write for us, and, and, and millions of people will read you. The problem is that's, that's terrific, and it might lead to something else, but you don't necessarily know for sure. And until then, it's like, all right, how am I going to make money off of this? Because the big newspapers, the big networks, the big media outlets, they did pay you enough to survive. And now it's going to be, you're going to have to hustle. You're going to have to do a lot more to not simply, you know, not, you're, you're, have to, you're going to have to have your, your feet in so many different pools when it comes to, all right, you know what, I can blog, I can moderate, I can, you know, I can shoot and edit or whatever it is, depending on what, what field you go into. And at the same time, you're, you're going to, I hate to say it, but you're going to kind of have to expect, unless you're, an entre unless you're entrepreneurial about it, you're going to pretty much have to expect to get paid less. And that's going to be a real problem. And that's, the problem is that's really going to cut off, you know, it, again, it doesn't sound high-minded, but that's going to cut off journalists. I mean, who would want to go into journalism when you're not going to make a living? I, Reagan had a, I'm going to quote Ronald Reagan. Reagan had a maxim a, about dealing in foreign policy. Yeah, I'm going to do the voice. Um, that I think can kind of apply to following news in, in the new media. And that is trust but verify, you know. Um, and, and also, as a corollary to that, never trust a Huffington Post headline. Yeah. They're always misleading. Whatever the Huffington Post publishes as a headline, and I'm speaking as someone who owes his political writing career to the Huffington Post, uh, whatever the headline is, the story is bound to be the exact opposite or completely unrelated to what the headline is. Uh, we talked about the cacophony of, of uh, so many myriad of voices out there, and the poor consumer is just being washed over with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you've described is basically what Time Magazine and Newsweek did to try to, to summarize what was going on with newspapers around the country. And I think that might very well develop. I think it has to some extent with bloggers. But I think uh, the question is going to be whether it's going to be a human interface or if it's going to be artificial intelligence that's doing that for us. You know, and I think that remains to be seen. I hope it's a human interface, but I don't know. And I just want to add in terms of the, the what you mentioned about breaking news, um, I would just say that while I think that social media largely drives um, 
like national breaking news or like world breaking news. I think that at least in my experience with feministing, uh, when we first um, when we first really uh, got our momentum, some of the stories that were the most impactful and just got the most traction were the local untold stories, the stories that we randomly found, you know, in a local paper in some, you know, random city um, that just did not, you know, basically, you know, just didn't have the attention. Um, and we being able to give it the attention on our site and be like, oh, wow, this is something no one knows about. This is something that we need to, to tell, you know, our community about. And that ended up getting, you know, basically sparking, you know, potentially national attention to it. So I think that that's just one thing that I feel like is still really valuable um, in journalism today is are those really local, personal um, stories that that need to be uh, need to be told. And our media is, it is ultimately concerned. So the question is, when do you see a when will we wake up to the idea that we are being brainwashed in a certain way, whereas there is uh, much liberal thought, even more than our liberal uh, left wing, we need to know that will happen based on, I guess, the people actually seeing that. Well, I mean, as far as the revolution, I mean, I think we're in it. I mean, I think we're in it now. Maybe at the, who knows it, how long it will last, but I mean, I think we're at least in the beginning of it. Um, and the very nature of, of what we're talking about here is, is, is what's happening, is, is that exact thing, where um, the traditional press has less and less power, and a democratized press has more and more power. It's, um, it's a valuable counterpoint to a, a for-profit corporate press. In fact, I, I, I often refer to the traditional media or traditional news media as the corporate news because, the, uh, and there are m many, many damaging aspects of that, uh, which we don't have time to go into tonight, but um, the, the social media, the citizen media reaction to the corporate press is, is, is that revolution, absolutely. And, and until uh, traditional media stops relying on official sources and government sources for, for three-fourths of their information, mm -hmm. there's not going to be a change. But I think that's starting, yeah. I think social media is starting to impact yeah. uh, traditional media because they're starting to pay attention to ordinary citizens more so than ever before. In fact, there was a movement a few years ago called citizen journalism within newsrooms to, to try to engage citizens as reporters and citizens as information providers. Uh, I think social media has the potential to, to usurp that, but I think it'll be a long time coming because there's so much corporate power with it. I guess my question, too, is uh, do people realize that it is a factor in the Because we have these tools, but I still feel like the majority are, in essence, sleepwalking, I guess. So when do people realize that fact? Given the state of education in this country and the support for it, I'm not optimistic. Uh, in this state, in Tennessee, we had an effort to try to enact a, uh, an income tax a few years ago that would have been much more fair and less regressive than the sales tax structure we have now. And the very people who would have benefited from the most were the most uh, uh, vehemently screaming against it. It was almost a, a visceral kind of reaction because they don't understand the issues and they don't understand the uh, situation that they're in. And they have been uh, educated about that by the forces that want to benefit from the current system. The status quo uh, benefits those in power. I think it's important also to uh, recognize that, um, you know, social movements are not, don't happen like that, you know? And I think that social media and online activism is a pretty young 
you know, phenomena. Um, and, and it really is only now, I think that things are really starting to speed up now. So I'm hoping that, I mean, and you know, like I said, like I would totally argue that social media played a role in the presidential election, which is like huge. That's like, and talking about, you know, we should actually take lessons from that, right? In terms of, cause that creates, that's systemic change. That's like, you know, long-term change. So I think that there, it, you know, I agree with Bob, it's, it's happening. I think it's just a matter of, you know, people are starting. I think people are starting to wake up. I think that this last election was a big, at least in terms of the online piece of it, um, was a big wake-up call for folks. I mean, activism is going up. Uh, voter participation, you know, voter turnout is going up. I, I think the amount of, the, the sheer number of people who are becoming increasingly informed, that's going up as well. Uh, because again, you have more news sources, you have almost an inescapable flow of news um, via Facebook especially, where as I said, you know, you, don't ease, you might not even be looking for the news, but you get it anyway, because other people post it on your wall. I think this is all positive change, and I think it takes a long time for that change to fully be realized. And I think if we're, we're talking about children who are born today, um, will be, uh, you know, being flooded with news and being flooded with information will be part of life. It'll be part of, it'll be just like eating breakfast. You'll, you know, that's just, you, you, information is going to be plentiful and unavoidable and how, how, how do you deal with it? And I think to that respect, um, it may not seem conceivable to us who, you know, I think many of us here grew up with three channels and one newspaper in our town. Um, so all of this still, even though we're professionals in it, all of this still seems so unusual and space age and, and weird. Um, but then at the same time, new generations are, it's gonna be commonplace. It's gonna be a matter of life to, to be informed and to be participatory. But again, the double-edged sword of that is that the more media outlets you have, the more tendency you have to just basically submit to confirmation bias. And you find the one media outlet that tells you what you want to hear, and you stick with that. I mean, honestly, look, you know, regardless of your political opinion, Fox News, is, it generates a bubble. It's, it's unbelievable. It's impenetrable. There's nothing like it. But there are other smaller bubbles that are being generated, and there are people who won't move outside of that. And one of the problems is without, you know, while it's great to have so many media outlets, if, if there isn't a, a source of information, and the, you know, this is a real problem, if there isn't a source of information that everybody can kind of agree on is the truth, is information, then the problem we run into is it, when you start debating politics with somebody, you're not just bringing your own opinions to the table, you bring your own set of facts. Well, Fox News says this, well, MSNBC says that. Okay, you know, never the two shall meet. And it becomes, it becomes very, very difficult to have a decent, you know, healthy conversation because everybody's trapped in their own little, you know, well, I get all my news from this source. Well, I get all my news from that source. And it turns out that a lot of times they, you know, they don't say the same thing or any, anything even close. I think it's great that we have so much information, but it, all that information also gives, gives way to a preponderance of misinformation. But the, the misinformation never goes unchallenged. I mean, you can, you know, you can flock to a website that, is, uh, that, that provides confirmation bias, but at the same time, you can't perpetually walk around without being challenged on that information. And I think that's also a valuable aspect of social media, especially one that's, that's more open like Twitter or one that's even closed to just family and friends like Facebook. You're going to be challenged on this, and so you need to be ready to be challenged. And I think that might ignite a spirit to go out and seek out more information. In, in the process, I, I've known so many people who have emailed me, friends, who said, or, or you know, like my brother will email me and said, I'm in this debate on Facebook, and this one guy is saying this, and this other guy is saying that, and I'm saying this other thing. Um, which one of us is right, and do you have any other information that you can provide to me, a link that I can post or something that will disprove that other guy? So everyone's getting, um, so no one's in a, entirely trapped in a bubble. You are still getting, whether you're Chuck Todd and I'm harassing you on Twitter, or whether you're just a blogger and you think that you're in your own bubble and you're 
preaching to the choir, and then a troll comes in, and maybe it's something obnoxious, but sometimes it's something that's kind of informative. They go, well, I'm going to have to check that out. And even if you disprove the troll, you're still checking it out. So I, I, I think I'm a, little <laughs> I'm a little more hopeful about confirmation bias than Chez is, because I, I, I just see the preponderance of discussion that occurs. Uh, under every post and, and every time you tweet something. I mean, on Twitter, Twitter's a great uh, format for getting those opposite points of view because if you have any followers at all on Twitter, you know that um, if you go and look at your, whatever the connections tab is where, you know, people, you can see all the mentions of your your name, um, see how sophisticated I am? I completely botched that description of Twitter. But, that, but you can often see people, uh, whether trolls or whether just people you know who disagree with you, reacting to some of the things you've said. So it's not entirely closed in, you know. I, I think also, uh, just to, to sort of a uh, little departure from this, is that globally, uh, I think the technology has allowed people in more closed societies to get information that they don't ordinarily wouldn't get. I have about 40, 50 friends in the United Arab Emirates. I see items in the news that I post on my uh, uh, Facebook, and they will invariably say, thanks for telling us this. We didn't know about this. And then these things are like the Star Trek transponder to me, you know, because if you have one of these in Skype, you can talk to anybody in the world. And I do that quite frequently. And that is a huge technological change and a huge uh, cultural change that brings people together in a global village sort of way that's never happened before. And I think that is, uh, will have some impact on uh, political change throughout the world. I think you guys are, um, you're talking about, personally, I feel like it's trying to like, people are like, oh, where'd you get that from? And I'm like, oh, the internet. And I'm like, what the heck? You're talking to you can't get the internet. So, like, as a young person, you definitely have time to watch the news. I mean, I don't really know. Um, and I don't get to the New York Times or anything, because I can't afford that. So, like, what do you, where, like, where, where do I get my political information from? Because I feel like I do follow Obama on Twitter, and that's where I get most of my information from. Yeah. I don't well, it's a, it's a great question because um, it, it, this actually speaks to forming um, uh, an argument and a point of view in the context of an of a op-ed piece or an opinion piece that you might write. What I try to do is I try to attain all of my wonky facts from indisputable sources if you're a conservative. So what I love to do is I love to get stuff from the Wall Street Journal or like Forbes or something, or even, um, even Fox News, the foxnews.com website. If you can get your facts and you can back up your argument with, some, with links to foxnews.com and Wall Street Journal, it, no one's going to argue with that. Or they oh, where'd you get that statistic? Wall Street Journal. They're not going to say, oh, that's liberal bias. Wait, that's not liberal bias. So I think that's a really um, kind of clever... It's uh, not necessarily a trick, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good persuasive tool to use. If you break outside of your own bubble and you seek out um, things that, that confirm your thesis from conservative news sources, I mean, it, 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 your argument becomes impenetrable. A good um, source that I uh, go to a lot um, is uh, Memorandum. Um, it's M-E-M-E-O random with a U at the end. Um, just, yeah, I can give it to you, but I think it's a really, it's, a, it's like an aggregator, right, of like political news, of the political news that's breaking throughout the day, and it has like the headline with uh, most of the time, like the, the main headline is uh, the mainstream news coverage of it, and then under it, it's all of the blogs that have covered that story and their perspectives on the story. So I think that is, you know, and that's right wing, left wing, you know. Um, so I think that, I mean, particularly I think is useful in terms of you know, just seeing everyone's different perspective of, of a particular story. And it's all breaking, so it's really helpful. Something similar to that is, um, well, it's, it's not entirely similar, but another good source is Tegan Goddard's uh, Political Wire. It's just, I mean, really quick bursts with links to, um, to the source material. But, I mean, the guy has, Tegan has a, a real, um, he has a great nose for news. I mean, he really knows what 
to um, define on his site what to post and, and what not to. And so it's a great kind of um, filter for um, determining what's really, really important that's happening. I, uh, I just have a series of websites that I go to, um, both left, right, and center, and, and you know, I'm honestly too voluminous to name. And, you know, when it's all, when all is said and done, then I'm like, all right, you know, I think I can probably form at least a semi-articulate opinion on this. I would just, the thing I recommend to all students is, uh, if you're not used to reading newspapers, look at USA Today. It's very digestible and very concise, and at least gives you a, a surface understanding of what's going on. And I think that's helpful. Uh, there's a couple of websites that uh, I can personally recommend. Uh, Feministing, uh, Bob Seska, <laughs> Daily Venter, and Deus Ex Malcontent are all premium sites. And if you want to get your Do news, not come you to me for the news. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we'd like to thank our panelists uh, for a great discussion. If everybody can give them a round of applause. And We'd also like to take a moment to thank our uh, contributing members, our contributing organizations that made this happen. The Department of Communications, the Department of Political Science, uh, the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Bucktainment, FMLA, and the Society of Professional Journal Journalists, and of course, the College of Democrats. And a very, very special thank you to BubbleGenius.com, Get all your bath and body needs from Bubble Genius. They make ve <laughs> vegan-friendly products, and they're run by two wonderful women. So that's, again, BubbleGenius.com. And again, thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it, and thank you to our panelists.